Schloss. Thank you very much. On November 30th, ChatGPT was released, which may sound like, oh, it's just another chatbot. I'm not sure if you know anything about chatbots, but the idea of a chatbot goes back to 1966. The first, so a chatbot is just a program that tries to act like a person. In 1966, the program that was developed was called ELIZA. The the idea of Eliza, it was supposed to act like a Freudian psychologist. So you would sit down and type, you would type with it. It would ask you something like, how are you feeling today? And you would say, oh, I'm a little stressed. It would respond with, why do you feel stressed? My mom wants me to get a master's. And it would respond with something either generic, like, how does that make you feel? Or, what do you feel about your mom? Tell me about a master's. It's just picking out certain words. There's nothing deep with it. What was interesting about that program was the fact that the people in the lab working with this research professor would spend hours talking to this. This terrified the professor, so much so that he believed within the next 10 to 15 years, there would be realistic communication, and he started fighting against this. He recognized this is bad for society. He, he's one of the key anti-AI advocates, or became at that time. And we've had a number of other chatbots come out since then, like ultimately like Siri's chatbot. Eliza's chatbot. The idea if you can talk to it and it understand human language and react to you, that's a chatbot. ChatGPT <clears throat> is a scale of magnitude better than the rest of these. Now we've had recent ones that come out and they learn things like how to be racist and how to be misogynistic and they quickly get shut down. They're like, whoa, we can't, you, you can't just let them loose in the wild because they learn terrible things from terrible people. So I'm gonna go over what a uh, chatbot can do, what ChatGPT can do. Uh, what limitations does it have? What are the implications for society? And some final thoughts. So some simple examples of what it can do. I know this is hard to read. I'm going to just put it in here so you can see the interaction. So I asked it, hey, suggest some ideas for my Toastmasters humorous speech. So first thing it can do is it can, it can spark your creativity. What's important about these chatbots are how they are trained. So you have this program, which you teach it how to understand natural language. Then you feed it a bunch of information. So a bunch of interactions. Now a lot of this uh, came from Twitter interactions. So some suggestions it says for me is, um, the misadventures of online dating, the art of being unplugged. And if I didn't like these, I could simply click a button and say, hey, Give me 10 more. Give me 100. It'll do it. So one thing it can do is it can take this vast amount of information it's been trained with. Now, it's not searching the internet. It's not doing that. It's, this is not it going out and looking on the internet right now. It's been trained about how the world works. And based on that static training up to 20, I mean, 2021, it's using the information and producing real results, which is kind of how we work as people, right? I know this is too small to read, but for example, if I say, hey, generate a basic Windows graphic app in Rust. 
It says, I'm sorry, but a language, as a language model, I cannot generate code that runs on a computer. Okay, that wasn't what I wanted, but it's making it clear, like, I can't do that for you. However, I can give a basic Windows graphics application in Rust using Winit and WGPU RS crates, which is what I actually wanted, anyways. And then it gives me actual code that runs. And at the end it says, this basic example that creates a window, sets a title, creates graphics, um, creates a device. Now please note, it's not guaranteed to compile and run without setup, such as configuring the development environment, adding dependencies, etc. Keep in mind, this is a conversation. So I respond to it. What do I need for dependencies? So to remember what we're talking about. We're talking about this application still. And I said, oh, you mentioned dependencies. What do I need? Like a real person talking to me. Like if I asked Dia, hey, Dia, how do I set up a, a basic Windows app? You'd say, well, you do this, 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 this. Now, you might need some dependencies. I respond, what kind of dependencies? Well, this is all you need right here. I copy paste that, that works. You can get advice. How do I become better at 3D printing? There are several ways to become better at 3D printing, including reading and learning what technology, familiar yourself with different types of 3D printers, material, and software. Seven useful steps to actually help you become better at what you want to do. So it's amalgamating all this knowledge from all these different places and putting it down into a way we can use as people. Here's the scary part for people. The threat of plagiarism is massive right now. Because ChatGPT is better than the average high school student. It's about as good as the average university student. So if I just type in, hey, make a 1,000 word essay comparing Hamlet to Rocky in the style of Mark Twain. It gives me a full essay here. It was only about 700 words, but that's okay. But for example, first off, let's consider the protagonist of each story. Hamlet, the Prince of Denmark, is a brooding and contemplative young man consumed by thoughts of revenge for his father's murder. Rocky Balboa, on the other hand, is a down-on-his-luck boxer from Philadelphia who dreams of making something of himself. Both characters are driven by a desire for something greater than themselves, but their methods of achieving that goal couldn't be more different. He's just like a solid high school student. He's like, this is an A high school student. It's not amazing, it's not brilliant. You're not gonna post this and say, wow, this is changing the world. But this is dangerous. And, but what it's done though, for those who aren't using it to replace themselves already, it does replace other things. Like for example, the there's a website called Stack Overflow that a lot of programmers use to get advice. They're like, hey, my program's not working, what's going on? And other programmers will look at that and say, oh, you forgot this, you're doing this wrong, that's out of date, just using their own knowledge. Requests on Stack Overflow have gone down dramatically since this came out. People just give their code to chat GPT and say, what am I doing wrong? And it's able to give advice back in a very natural human way of saying, well, you need to do this with your program. Here's what you're trying to do. It's not working. Here's what you need to do. Exactly what a good person would do, except for it's not a person. It's just taking all this information. Companies are hiring AI employees. So they'll have a team of five people in their marketing department. They go down to three, and they have two AI bots. It's not just chat that's going on. This is happening with art. There's a pro, there's a an AI program called Doll E. If you say, please give me an oil painting of the Ambassador Bridge in the style of Van Gogh, it will. It'll give you four versions of it. Which one do you like? I can do this all day. 
for any human who uses intelligence in their job, your job's in danger. If, if you're laying bricks, you're fine. Physical labor, not replaced yet. What are the limitations of this? Of course, there's physical limitations. There are limitations in terms of an AI is only as good as the information it's fed. If you ask it for advice, if I ask it, what is better, A or B? It might say, oh, A is better, here's why. You ask it again, it might say, B is better, and here's why. Which is interesting, it's kind of like a real person. There's not a definitive answer for some things out there. So the limitations are, based on things it's heard, it can give you contradictory answers. I was watching a person who was using ChatGPT to generate 3D models. So there's a language called OpenSCAD, which can, you can use to generate 3D objects. And he would ask it, make a Christmas tree ornament for me. Sometimes it wouldn't work. You would generate code that was just faulty. Like you try it and use it, like, oh, that doesn't actually work. So it, it can give you wrong answers. It would even like use commands that aren't in the language. What's interesting about it, it'll apologize. Oh yes, you say, that's not part of the language. Oh yeah, sorry, yeah. I don't know, I, was, I just thought it should be. <laughs> so it has limitations. Previous um, chatbots, they'd be very specific. They, if, you did, if you didn't know what you're talking about, it would say, please clarify. ChatGPT is more likely to just guess. Uh, I don't know. Here, let's try this. This is pretty close. So it's more likely to give wrong answers. Now, they do previous programs, the chat would have a danger of giving dangerous information. Um, racist, sexist, like just, they built into this the idea that here's our code of conduct. Don't violate that ever. And so that's good. But it has limitations, obviously. The implications for society. This is where we really don't know. Here's the number one danger. There is a point in our current society where if, you're, if your IQ is too low, you can't add a lot of meaningful contributions to society. Like there's a point where if your IQ is very low, we, we can't properly instruct you how to take uh, an, a letter and put it into an envelope. It's, it's, that's the folding and the inserting. With chat GPT, that level keeps rising where the AI, the, your intelligence required to be more useful than this is reaching dangerous levels where the average person can't do a lot of intellectual things that are useful, can't do something that's better than the AI. And so we're hitting a tipping point where it's gonna start endangering lots and lots of different jobs. Teaching jobs, for instance. We're gonna reach a point where the AI is better than every teacher out there, even me. It'll even start becoming funny, I guess. Okay. So, we're, we're at a, a precipice in society. Whenever there's a big change in society, everyone says, the sky is falling. This is the worst thing ever. Society's never gonna be the same. It's all gonna be fire and brimstone. We, we, we've reached the most, oh, uh, I can't remember truculent moment of our society. <laughs> the truth is, with every change comes challenge. We must embrace the challenge and learn how to thrive within it. That's always the answer. The sky is not falling, it never is. We must embrace the change. We must learn how to become our best selves by incorporating this as awkward and as weird as it may sound. This is not the end of the world. It's a change in the world. Back to you, Madam Postmaster. Thank you, Ron. This reminds me the the new AI program in our uh, in our school.